Greetings. I'm Bahman Azad, uh, Organizational Secretary of U.S. Peace Council and a member of Coordinating Committee of Hands of Syria Coalition. I would like to welcome you all here to this important gathering. I think we are all going to benefit from it and learn a lot from the material that, that uh, Steve Collins has for us. Um, before anything else, I would like to thank our host, uh, International Action Center, for allowing us to have this meeting here. And, uh, and uh, before we start with Steve, um, I would like to ask a few of our sponsors of the program. Uh, to step up here and give a few words. Before anything else, I would like to ask Taryn, who has been responsible for putting it together, to have a few words, please, Taryn, from International Action Center. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's really great to see such a great turnout here in the room. I think that the most cliched thing that people could say nowadays is that the people in the Middle East are sick of war. Uh, there's been war raging across that region for longer than I've been alive. Um, I think it would be pretty cliched to go ahead and say that though. I think what really needs to be said is that people in the Middle East are sick and tired of U.S. imperialism and NATO imperialism. I think that the people in the Middle East are not predisposed to war, as some might lead you to believe. I think that it has been a very long project of divide and conquer, of extracting resources, and of putting you know, the United States even further towards its goal of trying to dominate the entire planet. Now, I think that ever since the Arab Spring in 2011, <clears throat> excuse me, I was screaming a lot yesterday, um, I think that ever since the Arab Spring in 2011, there's been a lot of misinformation that goes out in the media every single day that leads people to believe that there is one narrative or another narrative or whatever it is that's happening on the ground there. But I think it's really important to understand that we need other voices to bring back what's actually happening on the ground there. So it really is our honor, it really is our pleasure to uh, host Stephen Gowans here tonight to talk about his book and also the situation in Syria. Um, so please welcome, make yourselves at home, USA hands off Syria, USA out of the Middle East, and thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Biju Brian, please, from Bayan, one of our sponsors. Thank you very much. 
my name is Vijay and I am speaking on behalf of Bayan USA. As the crisis of imperialism led by US imperialism intensifies globally, so too does the crisis of endless wars of aggression in all its forms against the peoples of the world. In this current stage of imperialism, there lies four main contradictions. The contradiction between US imperialism and the oppressed peoples of the world, the contradiction between imperialist countries, the contradiction within imperialist countries between the ruling clique and the working class. There is also the contradiction between US imperialism and states and peoples asserting national sovereignty and self-determination. The last contradiction is the current situation of the Syrian people, a state and people under fire of US war of aggression, US field sectarian violence and destabilization. To stand with the people of Syria and for their self-determination is to stand against the US imperialist agenda in the region. As a neo-colony neo of the US, the Filipino people are also struggling for our, our national liberation from this global prison known as US imperialism. Today in Mindanao, the US government is also fueling sectarian violence through ISIS to destabilize the region and create a pretext for martial law, a tool of US imperialism to control the region's resources as well as justify US special operation forces on the ground under the guise of a so-called US war on terror. As nations oppressed by a, con a common enemy, we stand with the Syrian people in their struggle for freedom from US imperialist intervention and for democracy. We believe the Syrian people are in the best and most capable position of determining their path, form of struggle, and their alternative. We call on the US government, the CIA, and US military to withdraw its operations, including proxy armies in the region to end its war on the Syrian people and to recognize the Syrian people's sovereign right to self-determination. <laughs> US CIA out of Syria, end the US war on the Syrian people, self-determination, for the Syrian people, long live international solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, I would like to ask now Joe Jamieson, the chair of the Queen's Peace Council. Thank you, I'll be brief. Uh, came to hear Stephen, not me. I'm Joe Jamison from the Queen's Peace Council, and I'm glad to see some Queen's people here tonight, Ron and Ellen and Mary and Gabe and lots of other Queen's people, Bob. Um, if I'm missing somebody, forgive me. Uh, about a year ago, I took a trip, thanks to this uh, brilliant fellow, uh, took a trip to Syria. And uh, when we got back, we had a press conference at the UN. And one of the co-leaders of that tour, that trip of anti-war organizations, uh, Henry Lowendorf from New Haven said memorably, almost nothing of what we hear about Syria is true in the US mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And uh, that saying or that statement stuck with me. Uh, over the years I have discovered Stephen Gowan's articles and uh, have been posting them and sending them to friends and reposting them and pushing them. And, and so I'm so glad that he's here tonight to clarify the situation and to, and to tell us about his book. And uh, so I really value uh, his work and I'm glad to, that people from Queens and Queens Peace Council could be here to support this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I would like to ask Bob Kilbert from uh, Merchants for Peace, Chapter 34, New York, to have a few words. Hi. Uh, as veterans, we know the true cost of war, especially against uh, civilians. Syria was a major country taking in refugees from other countries until a few years ago. And now 
There's so many Syrian refugees that are fleeing the country because of the war, because the U.S. attacks and the war that war is going on there. Um, Veterans for Peace is proud to be a sponsor of the Hands Off Syria Co Coalition, and we're looking forward to listening to Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Raja Kiran, Chair of the New Jersey Peace Council. Uh, good evening. Uh, about a year ago, in my living room, a group of New Jerseyans gathered to hear Joe Jameson's report on the Peace Council, U.S. Peace Council's trip to Syria. And they were so uh, moved by his remarks and revelations that uh, they decided to form a New Jersey branch of the uh, U.S. Peace Council. Everybody. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, Steve going here to support him. Uh, we know his work uh, long before Syria. We wrote a book on the Soviet Union. And he's always been a voice of reason and progressivism and anti-imperialism. We're happy to be here, happy to support him, and I'm particularly happy to meet him. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Well, I'm really honored to have my dear friend, uh, Steve Collins, to agree and come here from Ottawa to make this presentation. I have known him through his brilliant articles for many years, and he finally topped it off with his brilliant work, Washington's Long War on Syria. We're going to have um, Steve make his presentations, and we will have the Q question answer period after that. Meanwhile, <coughs> his books are available in the back for sale, and he would be happy to sign them for you. So, please welcome Stephen Cohen. Hello, thank you. So, I'm going to talk about my book, but uh, I'm going to begin by talking about another book. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a book written by a man named Graham E. Fuller. Who is Graham E. Fuller? Graham E. Fuller had a 27-year career in the U.S. foreign policy establishment. At various times he was CIA station chief in Kabul, he was senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation, and he was vice chair of the National Intelligence Council, the body which produces the National Intelligence Estimate. Today he teaches uh, history in my country, Canada. In a book ambiguously titled A World Without Islam, Fuller asks whether the relationship between the West, led by the United States, and the Arab and Muslim worlds would be any different in the absence of Islam. Do we have an echo here? Yes. Sorry. Here, can you still hear me if I speak over here? I still have the echo. Okay. So, <laughs> he asked, would the relationship between the West led by the United States on the one hand and the Arab and Muslim worlds on the other be any different in the absence of Islam? And his answer is no, that the conflict between the West and the Arab and Muslim worlds originates not in a clash of civilizations, but in the oppression of the Arab and Muslim worlds by the West. So let me quote Fuller, because I like to quote people who are from the U.S. foreign policy establishment. The United States today is by its own reckoning the overwhelmingly dominant power in the globe in all spheres with the determination to impose its will by one means or another. He goes on, the term imperialism cannot be far off the mark. Even after the formal age of Western imperialism, new forms of imperialism were introduced in the modern era, especially in the Middle East, 
starting with the pliant rulers selected by the British to dominate the newly, and he puts this in quotation marks, independent governments of most states. These rulers were expected to be responsive to Western needs and preferences in the absence of support from their own people. Today, continues Fuller, the majority of leaders in the Arab world and elsewhere are supported in power by the West and pursue pro-Western policies unpopular with their own populations. Unquote. So those are the views of the former vice chair of the National Intelligence Council. Well, if Fuller says the majority of leaders in the Arab world are supported in power by the West and pursue pro-Western policies unpopular with their local populations, that means a minority of leaders in the Arab world are supported in power by the West. A minority of leaders who, we may infer from Fuller's analysis, who are not supported in the West because they fail to support pro-Western policies. So what leaders make up that minority? Well, one way to figure that out is to consider where the U.S. military footprint is absent. In the Arab and Muslim worlds, there are or have recently been U.S. military installations in Turkey, Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Yemen, Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, Afg Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Djibouti, and the Philippines. So what Arab and Muslim countries are conspicuously missing from that list? Well, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Iraq under Saddam, Libya under Gaddafi, and Syria under the Assads. There are no U.S. military bases in Saddam's Iraq or Gaddafi's Libya, not because the United States refused to establish military bases in those countries, but because Saddam and Gaddafi refused to allow them. I mean, neither leader was willing to permit his country to be integrated into Washington's undeclared informal empire. There are no U.S. military bases in Iran. Indeed, the country's constitution forbids the establishment of foreign military installations in the country. There are no U.S. military installations in Syria, except for those that are there illegally, established by U.S. forces in contravention of international law. So, parenthetically, there are 70,000 U.S. troops in Europe, scattered throughout the continent, along with tactical nuclear weapons, by the way, more than 70 years after the end of the Second World War. You might wonder why. In an extraordinary interview conducted with United Press International in 2002, former U.S. Secretary of State Al Haig, who had also been Supreme Commander of NATO <coughs> forces, said that U.S. troop presence on the continent was, or quote, keeps European markets open to us. If those troops weren't there, said Haig, those markets would probably be more difficult to access. Now significantly, I mean, Haig had acknowledged that a core function of the U.S. military is to safeguard the interests of corporate America. Is this an outlandish idea? Well, one U.S. Marine Corps general who at the time of his death was the most highly decorated Marine in history, in a 1935 confession, said that he'd spent 35 years of military service as, quote, a high-class muscle man for big business for Wall Street and the bankers. More recently, Condoleezza Rice, former U.S. Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, told National Public Radio, in connection with the release of her memoirs, that U.S. foreign policy is not guided by goals of democracy and human rights promotion, but that, quote, for every president, for every Secretary of State, American national security and American economic interests, of course, that is the primary goal. So my argument is that the markets, the labor, the resources of Iraq under Saddam or Libya under Gaddafi were not fully open in an unimpeded manner to the United States. And that the policies of the Islamic Republic of Iran today and of Syria today are impediments to U.S. investment in trade. 
and that the hostility of Washington to Saddam's Iraq, to Gaddafi's Libya, to the Islamic Republic of Iran, and to what I'm going to call Arab nationalist Syria, is ultimately traceable to the U.S. project of exploiting the Arab and Muslim worlds economically and the resistance of these states to that project. Now, by the way, the UPI interview with Hay from 2002, 2002, appeared under the headline, Haig, Syria should be the next target. And I mention this to remind you that Washington's long war on Syria began long before 2011, when U.S. President Barack Obama demanded that his Syrian counterparts step down. It began long before that, and indeed long before 2002. So, let's turn directly to Washington's long war on Syria. And let me begin by saying that while the book is titled Washington's Long War on Syria, that the war in Syria is more multiform than the title suggests. It's not only a war between Washington and its allies on the one hand, and the government in Damascus and its allies on the other. It's also a civil war. A civil war that's been going on since the late 1940s between Islamists on the one hand and secularists on the other. These two groups have a very different and ultimately irreconcilable ideas about how to organize Syrian society. The two major antagonists in this long-running civil war are the secular Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party, whose partisans came to power in 1963 in a military coup. And the Muslim Brotherhood, which is Syria's premier organization of Sunni political Islam, which is the ideological antecedent of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, though these groups have also been influenced by other forms of political Islam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to step you through an historical timeline of the conflict in Syria with its elements of civil war and its elements of interventionist war. In the mid-1950s, Washington conspired with London to purge Arab nationalist and communist influence from Syria. Their target was a triumvirate of well, there were two, commun or two Arab nationalists, one communist leader, who Washington and London perceived as threatening Western economic interests in the Middle East. Spearheading this effort was a man named Kermit Roosevelt of the Roosevelt family, which gave your country two presidents. Kermit himself was infamous for having engineered the overthrow of Iran's Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh because Mossadegh had committed the grave crime against Western domination of nationalizing his country's oil industry. Roosevelt and British intelligence, MI6, planned to enlist the help of the Muslim brothers to overthrow the three men in Damascus they saw as threatening Western <coughs> economic interests. In the 1960s, the Muslim brothers led protests, led strikes, led demonstrations, led riots in Syria all kinds of ructions under the banner of Islam or Ba'ath Arab Socialism. Or to put it another way, Islam or Secularism. These disturbances were always in opposition to what the brothers called the government's godless character. In 1967, in the wake of the Six-Day War, the Brotherhood declared a holy war against the Ba'ath Arab Socialists, denouncing them as infidels and as enemies of God. In the 1970s, the Brotherhood established an underground paramilitary organization anticipating the so-called rebels of today. In the 1970s, rebels were trained and armed outside of Syria, just as today's rebels are trained and armed outside of Syria in Jordan and Qatar with U.S., Saudi, Qatari, Turkish, and Jordanian money. The Brothers launched a major campaign of urban guerrilla warfare. They assassinated Ba'ath Arab socialists, they murdered state officials, they killed army officers, they attacked Syrian government offices, and they assaulted Syrian military installations. In 1973, the Ba'ath Arab Socialist president of the country, Hafez al-Assad, the current president's father, oversaw the drafting of a constitution for Syria that promulgated a mission for the Syrian state. 
The mission would be to foster the unity of the Arab world, to overcome its particularisms, its confessional, its sectarian, its religious differences, in order to achieve the Arab world's liberation from foreign domination, and to modernize and indigenize the economy. There was a, an Arab nationalist who asked the question, how is it that five Arab armies were unable to defeat the Zionists in the 1948 Arab Israeli war. His answer, because there were five Arab armies. So the point of the Arab nationalists was to overcome the divisions within the Arab world uh, in order to overcome its domination. They wanted to or modernize the economy and indigenize it. This would be accomplished through state planning or ownership of the economy and planning of the economy self-directed development of the economy to overcome the Arab world's relegation to a subordinate place in the international division of labor. In Washington, Assad was denounced as an Arab communist. He wasn't a communist. In fact, he was very suspicious of communists. And communists were very suspicious of him. But from Washington's perspective, he may as well have been a communist because his policies had implications for corporate America, which were equal in effect to those of policies that authentic communists would have implemented. In 1980, Robert Baer, Robert Baer is a CIA officer, he spent decades in the Middle East. He found that Syria was, quote, the epicenter of Islamist terrorism. Baer wrote, when I first set foot in Damascus in 1980, I estimated that Assad had maybe three or four years before he went under. The Muslim brothers owned the streets. The mosque schools were teaching jihad. The mosque public address system blared out a message of hate and revenge. I figured this guy's going to get strung up on a light pole, along with a whole lot of other Syrians in downtown Damascus. Well, in 1980, the brothers established an Islamic front for Syria, whose manifesto declared a war without end until that era of socialism, that is secularism, was exterminated in Syria. And by the way, there are three things the Muslim Brothers and other Sunni sectarian political Islamists hate about that era of socialism. They hate the ideological foundations of the Ba'ath Arab Socialist Project, and those foundations are nationalism, secularism, and socialism. Why do they hate them? They hate these ideologies because these are ideologies of European origin. They're foreign to the Muslim world. They're foreign to the Quran, and therefore they're foreign to God. So Ba'ath Arab socialism, in the view of the Muslim brothers, represents a foreign and godless implantation in the Muslim world, which must therefore be exterminated if the Muslim world is to be liberated from its domination by the West. So liberation in this view amounts to re-Islamization, or a project of restoring Islam to its previous primacy in the Arab world. The Ba'ath Arab socialists have the same goal of liberating the Arab world from its historical domination by the West. But they propose to do so in a very different way. First, by overcoming the Arab world's differences, particularly its relig religious cleavages, and by marshalling its economic assets for its own state-directed development. The project is guided by three goals, which are expressed in the Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party's motto. Freedom, so it's freedom from foreign domination and foreign interference. Unity, which is unity of the Arab world. And socialism, defined as state ownership and planning or self-directed economic development. In 1982, the Muslim Brothers seized control of Hama, Syria's fourth largest city. They went on a blood-soaked rampage through the city. They attacked police stations, they murdered Ba'ath Arab socialists, they executed government officials, they killed soldiers. Every Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party official in the city was executed, many by decapitation. In the Syrian government operation to quell the uprising, the Syrian Arab army captured more than 15,000 foreign supplied firearms, along with prisoners, including Jordanian and CIA trained paramilitaries. 
Likewise, insurgents operating in Syria today have been trained by the CIA and other Western intelligence services in Jordan and Qatar. In the 1990s, the Muslim Brotherhood established an alliance with other sectarian Sunni political Islamists to form what they called the National Front for the Salvation of Syria, which perhaps would have been more aptly called the National Front for the Salvation of Syria from Arab nationalism, from secularism, from socialism. The front had two goals. The first, the most immediate and pressing goal was to assassinate Assad, the second, longer-term, more fundamental goal was to establish a state based on the Quran. So let's jump to 2001. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, retired U.S. Army General Wesley Clark, who had led the NATO assault on Yugoslavia in 1999, told a reporter that during a trip to the Pentagon, he'd learned that plans had been drawn up to invade a number of countries, including Iraq, which was soon after invaded, including Libya, which was eventually attacked, and Syria, among others. In 2002, Syria was added to the Bush administration's axis of evil, its regime change hit list. You'll recall that the original list consisted of Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. In 2002, three countries were added to the list, Sudan, Syria, Cuba. Washington claimed that Syria was developing weapons of mass destruction and supporting terrorism, the same bogus charges it leveled against Iraq. Iraq, by the way, was also governed by Ba'ath Arab socialists. The bogus charges leveled at Iraq now leveled at Syria, or let's go back, the bogus charges leveled at Iraq was a pretext to topple the Ba'ath Arab Socialist government in Baghdad and ultimately to privatize an economy which Washington denounced as socialist. In fact, they called it viciously socialist. Um, and the Iraqi economy was indeed, to a large degree, publicly owned and planned. Iraq had combined its oil wealth with public ownership and planning of the economy to produce what one former U.S. State Department official had called the Golden Age. He wrote, quote, schools, universities, hospitals, factories, theaters, museums proliferated. Employment became so universal that a labor shortage developed. Or as veteran foreign affairs correspondent Robert Fisk recently wrote, Saddam used Iraq's oil wealth to cover the country in superhighways, modern technology, state-of-the-art health care, and hospitals and modern communications. The same former U.S. State Department official who remarked on Saddam bringing a golden age to Iraq wrote about Gaddafi that by combining Libya's oil wealth with public ownership and planning of the economy, Gaddafi's government had enabled Libyans to, quote, live beyond the dreams of their fathers and grandfathers. Well, in 2003, following the U.S.-British invasion of Iraq, this isn't widely known, but it's on the public record. You can see it in the uh, U.S. Congressional Research Service reports. The United States fully intended to invade Syria following its invasion of Iraq, but discovered that its hands were filled with the pacification of Iraq and Afghanistan and that it would have to achieve its regime change goal by other means. The first alternative to an invasion of Syria was to impose broad-ranging sanctions on Syria to do what sanctions are always intended to do, namely destroy economies. Destroy economies in order to make the lives of ordinary people so miserable that they rise up to try to overthrow their government, to effect, in effect act as instruments of the governments that impose the, the, the sanctions. Sanctions are also useful for propaganda purposes. I mean, once you've ruined a country's economy, you can blame the economic difficulties on the fact that the government has, as the Syrian government had done, pursued socialist policy, forgetting that sanctions had destroyed the economy. Well, the sanctions, as intended, devastated Syria. In October 2011, the New York Times reported that the Syrian economy, quote, was buckling under the weight of pressure of sanctions by the West. By the spring of 2012, sanctions-induced financial hemorrhaging had, quote, 
forced Syrian officials to stop providing education, health care, and other essential services in some parts of the country. By 2016, according to a leaked UN internal document, US and EU economic sanctions on Syria were causing huge suffering among ordinary Syrian, Syrians and preventing the delivery of humanitarian aid. The veteran foreign affairs correspondent Patrick Coburn likened the sanctions imposed on Syria to the sanctions that had been imposed on Iraq from the early 90s to 2013, or 2003 rather. Those sanctions, according to a UN estimate, had led to the deaths of nearly 500,000 Iraqi children through disease and malnutrition. That is, had produced more deaths than all the weapons of mass destruction used in history. This led two political scientists, John and Carl Mueller, to dub the sanctions sanctions of mass destruction. I mean, more devastating than the atomic bombs that have been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, more devastating than all of the chemical weapons used in the First World War. Largely, Young recognizes that sanctions of this caliber have been destroying Syria for the last 14 years. I mean, we see the attacks carried out by Washington's proxy guerrilla armies. We see the <coughs> eviscerations and the decapitations and the barbecuing of heads and the eating of hearts and the uh, suicide bombs and the car bombs. But what we don't see are the invisible, but equally, indeed, more devastating effects of sanctions. Now, significantly, the moment sanctions were lifted on a defeated Ba'ath Arab Socialist, Iraq, in 2003, they were immediately imposed on an unbowed Ba'ath Arab Socialist, Syria. Which means that from the early 90s to 2017, to today, to the past quarter century, the United States and its allies have waged a highly destructive campaign of economic warfare, the equivalent of a nuclear attack, first on Iraq, subsequently on Syria, and have done so what? They've done so because they're opposed to the Ba'ath Arab Socialist program of bringing the politics and the economies of the Arab world under the control of the people who live and work in the Arab world. Well, if sanctions constituted the first means by which regime change was to be brought about, the second was to reignite the Islamist war on the Syrian state. In 2006, Syria's Muslim Brotherhood had at least two meetings at the White House, according to the Wall Street Journal. In 2007, the Muslim Brotherhood helped found the National Salvation Front. The Salvation Front met frequently with the U.S. State Department and the National Security Council as well as with the U.S. government-funded Middle East Partnership Initiative, according to the Wall Street Journal. In late 2010, just months before, riots were to erupt in the Syrian city of Dara, the small city of Dara of 98,000, eight miles from the Jordanian border. And riots erupted. This is usually marked as the beginning of what became known as the Arab Spring in Syria. Just a few months before that, the Muslim Brotherhood declared its hope that a coming civil revolt would topple Assad's so-called heretical government. Well, that hope, the hope of a civil revolt, was realized only a few months later. But Washington and the Muslim Brotherhood had been working toward it since 2006. But in early 2011, before the uprising in the city of Dara, upheaval swept across the Arab world, except in Syria. All was quiet in Syria. And this perplexed Western news organizations. I mean, there are demonstrations in Tunisia. There were demonstrations. There was tumult in Egypt. There was an uprising in Libya, but not the slightest evidence of distemper in Syria. So the New York Times and Time Magazine dispatched reporters to find out why Syria was quiet. Here's what they reported. They said all was quiet in Syria because the government had broad support. They said all was quiet in Syria because even critics conceded that Assad is popular. They said all was quiet in Syria because Assad had, this is Time Magazine, endeared himself to the population. 
particularly to young people, the sector of the population from which a rebellion was expected to spring, if indeed a rebellion materialized. They said all was quiet in Syria because attempts to organize protests against the government had failed. Time magazine said they fizzled. Syrians, the reporters said, seem to feel no compulsion to protest against their government. And you can confirm all this by searching the internet archives of the New York Times and Time magazine for articles on Syria <coughs> written in February, March, April 2011. Well, in mid-March 2011, riots <coughs> broke out in Dara. They were violent. Some rioters carried arms. Buildings were burned. Vehicles were set fire to. Even U.S. officials, according to the New York Times, quote, acknowledged that the demonstrations weren't peaceful and that some protesters were armed. Now, in the mythology that would later develop about the origins of the post-2010 conflict, this became the protests were largely peaceful, which is an interesting sentence construction. Largely peaceful means they weren't peaceful, but is written in such a way to suggest they were. The modifier largely was dropped altogether eventually so that the story became the demonstrations were peaceful. But at the time, neither the New York Times nor US officials saw the protests as peaceful and acknowledged that they were violent. A week after the outbreak of violence in Dara, Time reported that, quote, there do not appear to be widespread calls for the fall of the regime or the removal of the relatively popular president. Well, that clashes with the narrative or the mythology that was subsequently developed. Over a month after the outbreak of violence in Dara, the New York Times' Anthony Shadid would quote, would report, quote, the protests fall short of popular upheaval of revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia. Significantly, Time would report that Islam was playing a prominent role in the demonstrations. So if we look back at the history of Syria from the 60s, we have civil disturbances fomented by Islamists dating to the 1960s. We have the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria declaring a holy war in 1967, a holy war that would last until Ba'ath Arab socialism was exterminated. We have Islamist guerrilla warfare dating to the 1970s, culminating in the violent takeover of Hama in 1982. We have Islamists meeting with the White House, with the State Department, with the National Security Council from 2006. At the point, Washington abandons plans for direct military intervention in Syria. And we have, according to Time magazine, Islam playing a prominent role in the protests, which are violent and involve arms. Well, consistent with this, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, one of a number of intelligence agencies in the large U.S. intelligence community, revealed that the insurgency was Islamist and led by, well, if you know the history of Syria, you can predict who they said it was led by, led by the Muslim Brotherhood and by Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the forerunner of Islamic State. So we have indication after indication that the uprising was not a peaceful, secular movement for liberal democracy, but a renewal of this Syria's decades-long civil war between Islamists and secularists, egged on, facilitated, financed by the United States and its allies, who needed a proxy to carry out a war because it could not invade Syria, owing to its entanglements in Afghanistan and Iraq. Indeed, the Defense Intelligence Agency said that the insurgents were supported by the West, were supported by the West's allies, the Gulf oil monarchies, and by Turkey. Well, there are three additional reasons to conclude that the uprising had nothing whatever to do with the pursuit of liberal democracy. First, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs had observed virtually all members of the various armed insurgent groups are Sunni Arabs. The fighting has been largely restricted to Sunni Arab areas, whereas areas inhabited by Alawis, Druze, or Christians have remained passive or supportive of the government. Defections from the Syrian state are nearly 100% Sunni. Money, arms, volunteers pour in from Sunni Islamic states and from pro-Islamic organizations and individuals, and religion is the insurgent movement's most important common denominator. Well, if this was a rebellion 
guided by secular democratic goals, why are Alawis, Druze, and Christians not participating? And that's not to suggest that all Syrians are opposed, or all Syrians are participating in the, not Syrians, uh, Sunnis are participating in the insurgency. That's not the case either. Uh, but the insurgency is largely Sunni-driven. Second, the Assad government amended the country's constitution to allow for multi-candidate presidential election. It had a, has, or had and has, a multi-party electoral system and now has a multi-candidate presidential system. It also suspended the security law, which I don't know what it would be called in, in the United States and Canada, it's called the War Measures Act. Um, the security law has been a vote for a number of reasons, not least of which is that Syria remains officially at war with Israel, which is illegally occupying Syrian territory in the Golan Heights. But Syria is in a very precarious security position. It faces internal threats and has for decades from Islamists who have a very different view about how to organize the society. It faces the external threat of the United States. It faces an external threat from Israel. It faces an external threat from the Arab allies of the United States, the Saudis, the Qataris, um, and the Turks. <coughs> so these concessions, though, so the security law was suspended, despite the fact that Syria is in a very precarious security situation. These <coughs> concessions in the direction of liberal democracy were immediately rejected by both the insurgents and their supporters in the West. Instead, the insurgency heated up, despite the fact that Syria now more closely approximated the paradigm of representative democracy favored in the West than did virtually every other Arab country, and certainly more so than did the military and royal dictatorships which constitute the principal ally or Arab allies of the United States. Third point, Zbigniew Brzezinski, recently deceased, Jimmy Carter's <laughs> national. <laughs> Jimmy Carter's national security advisor tartly observed. No, you should applaud the point he's going to make here. You know, we started helping the rebels, whoever they are, and they're certainly not fighting for democracy given their sponsorship, Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Well, he might have added they're certainly not fighting for democracy given their sponsorship, which includes most significantly the United States, right. which promotes not democracy, but as Condoleezza Rice acknowledged, U.S. business interests. The late Middle East specialist Patrick Seal wrote that the Syrian uprising should be seen as only the latest, if by far the most violent episode in the long war between Islamists and Ba'athists, which dates back to the founding of the secular Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party in the 1940s. It's not inspired by secular <coughs> liberal democratic goals. It's inspired on the part of insurgents by Islamists and sectarian goals, and on the part of the United States by imperialists and profit-making goals. At the same time, the veteran foreign correspondent Patrick Coburn wrote not too long ago that Washington has always wanted to get rid of Assad long before 2011. Long before 2002, when Haig said Syria ought to be the next target. They wanted to get rid of him when he came to power in the year 2000, just as Washington always wanted to get rid of his father, who was viewed as an Arab communist. So the United States and sectarian Sunni political Islam formed an alliance of convenience, a tactical alliance to eliminate a common enemy from the Syrian state. Now, the standard operating procedure of U.S. campaigns of regime change is to reduce governments Washington abhors to a single individual who can be demonized as a Hitler or branded as a brutal dictator or an animal or a moral disgrace, an animal, that's what Trump called Assad. A moral disgrace, that's what Noam Chomsky called Assad, and so on. But the enemy is not the individual. I mean, if Assad were to step down today and leave in his place a successor who also embraced bad Arab socialist values, 
the war would continue. The war would continue because the Islamists would never accept someone who supports Ba'ath Arab socialist values, and nor would Washington. Indeed, when the Ba'ath Arab socialist Saddam was driven from power in Iraq, the military dictator Washington imposed in Iraq, L. Paul Bremer, immediately, his first act was depathification of the Syrian state. That is, removing from posts in the, or the Iraqi state, removing from posts in the Iraqi state every member of the Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party. Washington then effectively imposed a constitution on Iraq which forbids secular Arab nationalists from ever again holding positions in the Iraqi state. If you read the constitution, there's a provision in the constitution which essentially says the Ba'athists cannot participate in politics and we know you're going to try and change your name so you're not going to fool us. We know who you are. So the objective of Washington's long war in Iraq was not the removal of Saddam alone, it was the debathification of the Iraqi state. Likewise, the objective of Washington's long war in Syria is not the removal of Assad alone, it's the debathification of the Syrian state. So, in public discourse, um, supporters of the Assad government are often denounced as apologists for dictatorship, or at best as questionable supporters of democracy. But the Italian philosopher Domenico Lucerto questions or challenges that view. Lucerto argues that if we are seriously concerned with the question of democracy, we should be concerned about democracy on an international level, with the democratization of international relations. He writes, if a country or a group of countries declare and decide that they have the right to provoke a war without the authorization of the Security Council, they are developing a theory in which the West has the right to exercise despotism over the rest of humanity. It's open despotism. The United States and West declare openly that they have the right to intervene in every area of the globe. That is despotism. He goes on to argue, as Patrick Coburn has, that Washington has always wanted to get rid of Assad. They said they should carry out a change of regime in Syria, Lesardo notes, because Assad is against Israel, it's against the West, and so on. That is despotism. And those who struggle against such despots are the real defenders of democracy. So let me close on this. A year after Muammar Gaddafi, inspired by the same goals that inspire the Ba'ath Arab Socialists, and those are summed up in the party's motto, let me remind you, unity of the Arab world, freedom from foreign domination and socialism. And indeed, there are explicit references to these values in the constitution Gaddafi crafted soon after coming to power. A year after Gaddafi, inspired by these goals of unity, freedom, and socialism, was removed from power by Islamists, backed by NATO, by the way, in the campaign to oust Gaddafi, Canadian fighter pilots, Canadian fighter pilots participated in that campaign, quipped that they were Al-Qaeda's Air Force. They knew they were Al-Qaeda's Air Force. How did they know? We know this because we now know from some work done by a Canadian reporter that Canadian military intelligence had reported to the Canadian government that the Islamist insurgents were Al-Qaeda connected. So they quipped about it. They joked about how they were Al-Qaeda's Air Force. So a year after Gaddafi was ousted by these Al-Qaeda-connected Islamists, backed by NATO, the Wall Street Journal revealed that Western oil companies had agitated for Gaddafi's removal because he was driving hard bargains and insisting that Libyans benefit from their own oil resources. Well. You know, U.S. oil companies, Western oil companies, believe that the petroleum resources of the Arab and Muslim world should be used for the enrichment of their shareholders, not for the benefit of the people who live in the region. And in fact, oil company executives are systemically and legally bound to hold this view. I mean, you're not going to last long as an oil company executive if you think the interests of Libyans are superior to the interests of your shareholders. Gaddafi held the very opposite view, that the interests of Libyans 
were superior to the interests of U.S. oil company shareholders. And as a consequence, he had to go. The day before this book went to press, I read a short essay by a notable Canadian named Norman Bethune. He's notable, probably no, more notable here than he is in Canada, actually, although he's notable. In, in China, he's notable. Um, the essay was titled Wounds, and Bethune was a skilled and innovative surgeon who was at the forefront of the fight for public health care in Canada, but he's mainly known for participating in two wars, for participating in the Spanish Civil War and the Second Sino-Japanese War in the late 1930s. In the Second Sino-Japanese War, Bethune joined Mao's forces as a frontline surgeon in the resistance against Japanese efforts to colonize China. And it was in China that Bethune wrote his essay. And his essay was a meditation on the causes of the war in which he was entangled, which produced the wounds he was called upon to operate on every day. And as I read the essay, it struck me that what Bethune was saying, in very few words, I had attempted to say in a whole book. So I quickly asked my publisher if he'd include a short quote from Wounds as the epigraph of the book, which he readily agreed to. So let me read it to you. Are wars of aggression, wars for the conquest of colonies, just big business? Yes, it would seem so. However much the perpetrators of such national crimes seek to hide their true purpose behind the banners of high-sounding abstractions and ideals. Well, today the high-sounding abstractions and ideals are expressed in the claim that the United States has a moral obligation to act, that Washington and the West have a responsibility to protect civilians from their governments and that we cannot stand idly by. Well, those projects are said to make up a civilizing mission which the West proclaims for itself, ostensibly to impart democracy and human rights and prosperity. Uh, to those parts of the world that have allegedly been denied. This is continuous with the French Mission Civilis et Peace used by Paris at the height of French colonialism to justify the rape of peoples of the French colonial empire. So the objective is to present a relationship of exploitation as a relationship of benevolence, of conferring the gifts of democracy and human rights on those people who have been afflicted. But the evidence that a civilizing mission is simply a cover for the perpetration of national crimes, as Bethune put it, is provided in what Condoleezza Rice recently acknowledged, namely that US intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq was not motivated by a mission civilisatrice, but by security goals. And for every president, for every secretary of state, American national security and American economic interests that is the primary goal. Well, under Iraq, under Saddam, Libya, under Gaddafi, Syria, under Assad, were impediments to the economic development and commerce of corporate America. And so, for every president, for every secretary of state, overcoming those impediments was and is the primary goal. The most insightful part of Bethune's essay, in my view, is the last paragraph. So in the last paragraph, he writes, what do these enemies of the human race look like? And he's referring to those who, in the hunt for profit, start the wars which create the wounds that he was called upon to operate on. Do they wear a sign on their foreheads so they may be told, shunned, and condemned as criminals? No. On the contrary, they're the respectable ones. They are honored, they call themselves and are called gentlemen. They're the pillars of the state, of the church, of society. They support private and public charities out of the excess of their wealth. They endow institutions. In their private lives, they're kind and considerate. But there's one sign by which these gentlemen can be told threaten a reduction in their profits, and the beast in them awakens with a snarl. They become ruthless as savages, brutal as madmen, remorseless as executioners. And when you read in the Wall Street Journal that Western oil companies had complained to the U.S. State Department that something had to be done about Gaddafi, who threatened a reduction in their profits, 
It's hard not to think of the pillars of society and respectable people of whom Bethune wrote. Well, Bethune ended his essay with this. Such an organization of human society as permits these enemies of humanity to exist must be abolished. And the overarching theme of this book is that Washington's long war on Syria can only be understood within the context of the organization of society as permits these enemies of humanity to exist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve.